Well, good morning to everyone. Um, I just want to back up uh, Beck, I think with it's amazing uh, and we need to be really thankful under God that we have a youth department that now functions as youth works and that we actually have, uh, we actually raise up people who are going to train our future leaders and starting from the teenagers. Uh, I don't know any other diocese in the world that has that. And we need to thank God for the vision that was that people have shared in the diocese and that has and people have caught that vision and it's been developed to what it is today. So isn't it wonderful that we've got this this training that people can go off to and there's lots of other training that's held as well and full time children's youth workers. It really is tremendous. So we need to thank God for that. So as we pray for it, let's pray for the bigger thing of youth works at the same time and that the whole thing will continue to grow and we'll be extreme, we will be blessed by it. Do you know? We will be blessed by it. Uh, let me lead us in prayer as we look to God's word this morning. Uh, Father, we just thank you that you have spoken to us clearly through your word and through your son. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your spirit that we should be able to come near to you, that we can hear your word, understand your word, and you give us grace to respond to that word in a way that's going to bring honour to you. So, Father, open our hearts, open our minds to what it is you wish to say to us from your word this morning. For in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, we're looking at, at Jude over these couple of weeks. Uh, one of the, the, the smallest books there is uh, in, in the New Testament especially. Uh, and, and Jude is, is a letter written by Jude who is a, a step brother of Jesus, uh, a brother of James, who was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And it's interesting, he introduces himself as he's writing to this group of Christians, he introduces himself as the servant, as the slave, as the one totally committed to Jesus. And he talks about, I'm committed to Jesus Christ, is the one I'm committed to. Jesus, Saviour, we've just gone through Christmas, we've gone over this, haven't we? Lord, uh, Christ means the anointed one. It means deity. It means the one sent from the Father. It means the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's who Jesus Christ is. They grew up with Jesus. And here, the, here he is, and James speaks when he writes to the church as well, uses exactly those same words, that, that they recognise that Jesus, who Jesus is. He is Christ. He is Lord. He is Saviour. And he's writing to the Christians. And it was a wonderful way we looked last week, or I think it's a great uh, illustration or just a little definition of what a Christian really is. Because the Christian is one who's been called, he's one who is loved, and it's one who is kept. All of God's action. If you know and love the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, as Jesus the Christ, the Lord, then that's been the work of the Spirit and as the work of God calling you, of having loved you in Christ, sent his Son to die for you and the promise to keep you and to keep you in the hands of the good shepherd, Jesus Christ himself. And then he spoke about mercy, peace and love. May the character of God so fill us to abundance that that's just who we are and that's how we live that's how we express ourselves. And now he continues his letter. This, although it's a longer passage, we don't have to go through every bit in it to get the point of what he's talking about. Uh, the passage is especially written to these particular people and what was happening to them. But as we look at what was happening to them, we will see we have our parallels today. Right? Remember I said that we are clothed a bit differently but the heart is still the same. And that's why the word of God touches the heart and no matter what culture you're in, no matter what age you are, no matter where you live on the face of the earth, because the heart is the problem, because that governs our actions, do you know? And that's the issue. So he says, dear friends, this is verse three, dear friends, um, I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. I felt compelled to write and urge you uh, could, uh, sorry, let me start again. 
Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into the license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. So he said, my intention in writing was to encourage you in the faith. To, you know? And so having just shared about that we're called and loved and kept, that's what I wanted to talk more about here. But the messages I hear from the church, I, I, I'm now compelled to write about this other issue. It is just so important. Because what has happened is that these false teachers have slipped in among you. They've slipped in among you. It, the, the slipped in among means that they've just, without you knowing it, you know, in other words, they've come and they've looked fine, uh, they've had all the right words, you know, all the right words and they've seemed good and they've just joined in the fellowship and before you know where you are, they're taking us away into a different direction to which we've been going in Christ Jesus. And he said, I felt I really had to write. I felt a compulsion to write and to urge you to contend for the faith. And the urge, that the word that's used here for the urge is the same word that Jesus used about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will, will come along your side, will come beside you. Right? And this is the same word. He said, so I want to urge you. I'm coming in beside you as brothers in Christ and I'm calling you. We need to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to God's holy people. To urge, to contend. And the contend is, is the concept of the athlete. In other words, this, this is going to take energy. This is going to take concentration. This is going to take strength if this is going to occur. And the faith once for all, he's talking about the body of truth that you have in Christ Jesus is what he's talking. So he's not talking about just simply your subjective faith. He's no saying. The faith, what is the faith? The faith that Jesus is the Christ. He died for our sin and he's risen again from the dead. It's the gospel that he's talking about here. We are to contend, we are to contend for the gospel we're to maintain the truth of the gospel. Now remember he's writing to all the members within this congregation, within this church, to where the letter goes. And so he's saying to all of them, brothers and sisters, we are called upon by the Lord to contend for the truth. We are all responsible to do that. It's not just certain members of the congregation, it's every one of us. If you know Jesus as having been called and loved and kept and you know the gospel of Christ and you know salvation, you know forgiveness of sin, you know the gift of eternal life, you know who you are in Christ Jesus, then that gospel we are all called to eagerly understand the gospel, grow in the gospel and contend for that gospel truth that it not be taken away from the church at all. Each believer responsible to maintain the truth and to carefully hand it on. Can you see where the conference that Beck is going off to this week, that's, that's part of our fulfilling this role that we have. That, that our young people do hear the gospel clearly. They're taught the gospel clearly. They know who and what they are in Christ Jesus, right? And they will be able to contend for the faith as the Lord has called us over our lifetime to contend for the faith. And this was the faith once for all entrusted to God's holy people. The gospel is clear and the gospel is nothing is to be added to it, nothing is to be taken away from it. God has spoken. It doesn't need any more developing. It doesn't need bits and pieces that aren't relevant anymore. I'm sorry, what God is saying, because this is speaking to the heart, 
and because this has to do with your relationship with me, then I have spoken and this is the gospel. The minute you move away from that, then you no longer have the gospel. When Paul was writing to the Christians in Galatia, he said to them, you're being, driven, you're being drawn away to another gospel, another way of salvation, which is not really a gospel at all because there's only one gospel. And that's the gospel that's been revealed to us in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the group that came in, here, the false teachers, some would have known them. They just didn't turn up. But they came in as a small group from what we gather from the passage here. And when they came and they were first part of the group, they had all the right words and, and, and quite plausible, you know, quite plausible. Um, last week, I've been, uh, Joan and myself have been participating online, as you do these days, with CMS Summer School. And, uh, and so, therefore, we've been listening to the missionary sessions, etc. And a couple of the sessions, the missionaries were talking about learning language and crossing cultures. And, and they said one of the big things that you've really got to learn is that words you use doesn't mean when this person uses the same word, they mean the same thing. We know that, don't we? Um, husbands and wives know that a bit, don't they? Uh, for Joan and myself, we don't always, we use the same language, but the same words, but we don't speak the same language sometimes. Am I making sense or not? I think, my dear, what did you mean by that? <laughs> and she looks at me and says, what on earth are you raving on about, Peter? You know, so we've got the same words, but where it's coming from is different. And so these people come in and they've got the right words. They've all got the right words, but what they're meaning from that and where they're going with that is totally and completely different but they have slipped in. We've already seen, as you look through, we went through Ephesians, <clears throat> how the devil is the author of lies and deceit. And the devil and lies and deceit, the way you, lies and deceit is, is the issue of slipping in, looking as though you're the real thing, and then you find out later that it wasn't. Um, the illustration I've often thought about myself is that if you and I decided that uh, down at, if we all went down the beach this afternoon and we've had our swim, we're sitting around, what are we going to do? Well, let, let, let's make some $100 notes, right? Let's counterfeit some $100 notes together. Let's really work hard on it. There's great copy machines these days, isn't it? If we doctor it all up, we can do it really well. So we're going to, we're going to produce it. If we're going to produce a counterfeit uh, $100 note, we're going to make it as close to the original as possible. Are we not? Otherwise, it's of no use, is it? We've got to be able to hand it over and the person doesn't know. That's, what, that, that's counterfeit. And that's what counterfeit is. If we don't write on it, beware, this is a counterfeit $100 note. We don't, we're not going to write that on it. And so isn't that, understand that's what lies and deceit. Lies and deceit is the devil, you, you, the, the way lies and deceit work, you get it as close as possible to the original that you cannot, you'll be taken in by it. You will think it's the original. But then once you've think and thought it's the original and you've taken that on board, before you know where you are, you're being slowly moved away from where you stood before. The author, the author of, the, author, the devil, the author, of lies and deceit. And as he said that the gospel written clearly, that, sorry, that he then says about the false teachers that there's nothing new here. Uh, we read from Ezekiel, right back at Ezekiel. Ezekiel is warning the people about prophets, about who uh, the shepherds of the Lord. That's their role. That's the words they're, that they're, that's the role they're doing. That's the words they're using. But they're not looking after the sheep at all. They're looking after themselves and not the sheep. And therefore the sheep are, are suffering and the sheep are going astray. They are ungodly, he says. They're ungodly. Their way of life is not the way of Christ. Their way of life is concerning themselves. They follow their own heart's desire. It's interesting, we live in a day and age where we are exalted in our culture day after day, minute after minute, that the best way to live is to follow your own 
personal heart's desire. Am I right? Now, in my family, if my whole family understood that the best thing for them is to follow my personal hearts and desire, we'd get on well as a family. But the problem is they're all doing the same thing. They want us to follow their heart's desire, right? And so we're all in different directions all over the place. And what is your heart's desire? Your heart's desire is simply for yourself. And where does that take you? We've got enough lonely people and desperate people who are all down that track of broken relationships, is it not? That, isn't that what it all boils down to? And, and this, this is the lie of the devil. This is the lie of the false teachers. And the result of immorality. There is no grace. That which God has given for our good, what lies and deceit and sin does, it uses that same thing that God has given us and twists it and perverts it, is what it does. Uh, th this earth is given to us to enjoy. God created for us to enjoy this earth. But what have we done? We just use it for ourselves and we twist what God gave it to us for and wrongfully use it all together against each other. Sexuality is a gift that God has given. But what do we do when it's just me and me alone? It gets twisted and perverted. And that's why it moves on to immorality. And they deny that Jesus Christ is the only sovereign and Lord. Jesus is Lord. When we look at the illustrations that Jude gives, each one of them, people are denying that God is king. And they put themselves as king. I know better than God is what they put themselves. In our church today, um, we are in a bit of a mess. Uh, the church is in a mess around the world. Our Anglican communion is in a mess around the world. And that is because we have groups coming up everywhere all around us who declare, I know better than God. And so forth, they pick up, well, there is the Bible, but I can tell you which bits are right and which bits, or which bits I want and which bits I don't want. And so I am, the, I am God and I can choose the bits that I want to go with and the bits that I don't want to go with. I've met many people who have said to me now, Peter, my, my faith is this, I follow the Sermon on the Mount. I say, well, that's great, but have you ever read the Sermon on the Mount? I wouldn't be game to say that. You, you know, if, if, even if you have um, a wrong thought in your mind, it's as good as having done it, the Sermon on the Mount says. Do you, right? What are you talking about? You believe that you set up your right to put God's word aside and therefore there's no need for salvation, there's no need for grace because I'm in control, I can run, I can do it all, right? And this is what coming into, this is where the false teachers come into the church. It's what we call liberalism in the church. And the, the authority of scripture is put to one side and therefore the authority is me rather than the authority of scripture. Uh, this we as an Anglican church came out of the Reformation and out of the Reformation was we were brought back to see the church is not the final authority. It's God's word that's the final authority and that's where we stand and that's where we stand as Anglicans. That's our 39 articles. It's very, very clear. That's our doctrine. That's our stand that we stand by. Now he says, he goes on to say now, you know, that, that there be false teachers. Um, that, uh, he said, I don't really have to... Um, you already know all about this, is what he's saying. You know about this already. When you look through the scriptures, you know the scriptures, and you know what's already been taking place. There's a warning. There will be false teachers, but there will be judgment. And the judgment is going to be from God. He, in the end, will make the judgment. Now, we need to be thankful as we look at this that it's God who is the final judge. We don't know each other's heart. Can I suggest to you that we don't know our own heart as well? Would you agree with me or not? I don't really know mine. Every so often there's things I say and do and I think, 
Who was that? Am I just the only strange person here today or not? We, we don't really know our own heart. We think we do, but we really don't. I am thankful that when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, Jesus was paying the penalty and price for my sin. That was the sins that I'm aware of. It's the sins I'm not aware of because he was aware of the lot. Do you see, do you see the whole point? He, the, he knows my heart. He knows the lot. And therefore he said, I am dying for the forgiveness of your sin. I'm paying the price for every one of those. We have disagreements with each other and we make a judgment, but sometimes we make the judgment rashly. We don't fully understand the situation. We don't really know what's in the person's heart and mind. Who are we to be that final judge? And that's why these articles, these bits as we go through now, are clearly saying it is God alone who can be the final judge. And thank thankfully, he is the final judge. Thankfully, he is the final judge. That finally, it's before him that I stand. And therefore, I stand without condemnation because I know he has known my sin and he has dealt with my sin in his own body on the cross. And therefore, it's in that confidence that I stand before him. But he gives the illustration that if you're going to wander away, then judgment will come. He talks about that when they came out of Egypt. Even though you already know this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed them who did not believe. They all came out. They all came through the Red Sea. They were all baptised in the sea, as Paul explains in Corinthians. But there were many who did not believe, and they did not get to the promised land. They were judged. He then speaks about these angels. It's interesting, when you come through this here in Jude, he's referring to what's happening within the church that he's writing to. And most of those were, were Jews within the, within the church. And therefore, they had lots of Jewish writings. Now, we as Christians have lots of Christian writings. We've got Augustine, you know, all the, all the, 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 the old fathers and so forth, and writers of today, do you know, that, that we have. And, and we read those and we're helped by those. Where there were these ancient writings as well. And he was saying, if, even in your ancient writings, and it talks about the angels and all of that who abandoned, they were judged by God. They were judged by God. Sodom and Gomorrah, we know that. I'm amazed how, have you noticed how, if people know virtually nothing about the Bible, but they do know about Sodom and Gomorrah, even though they don't know it's in the Bible, isn't it? It, it is something that really has hit us as human beings. And the sad thing with Sodom and Gomorrah is, is that it, it, it was sexual immorality that caused the downfall. You know, I was just reading something the other day from a secular writer, not a Christian writer, who was just saying, making comments, and he was commenting and saying, when you look back over history, nations have risen, risen and nations have fallen, and a massive percentage of nations, as they fall, they fall from rot within, not from attack from without. The attack from without comes, but they fall because they're already rotten from within and they fall away. And sexual immorality is one of the key things that pops up in almost every nation across the face of the earth with this. He says, in the same way, in the strength, he talks about their dreams that they talk about. They talk, he talked about Michael at the Archangel, which is another writing that they had. And they talked about these people, yet these people slander whatever they do not understand and the very things that they do understand by instinct as irrational animals, will that, will that, that will destroy them. And then he gives the three examples, he gives three woes of Cain and Balaam and Korah and you can look at that and look at the Old Testament passage with that. But what he then says, well, how do we recognise them, these false teachers? What is it that we should be looking for? Yes, there is this false teaching that comes, but if it's lies and deceit, then they're going to use all the right words. They're not going to come and say, I'm a false teacher. How do we recognise that they are a false teacher? How do we recognise it early? We'll look at verse 12. He says, these people are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. 
They are clouds without rain, blown about by the wind, autumn leaves without fruit, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming in their shame, wandering stars from whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. This is a description of these people. They are blemishes on your feast. They're a dangerous threat to your fellowship and to yourself. And they're shepherds who only feed themselves. They're only interested for what they get out of you. That's their interest. That's their interest. They're clouds without rain. There's lots of promise coming here, but nothing, there's nothing that comes from it. They're blown by the wind. They're uncontrolled. There's no real fruit. Remember, Jesus said, by their fruit you will know them. Look at the life and see what the life is. Is this the life of the Spirit or is it not? And there is rich, darkest, blackest darkness that's reserved for them. These false teachers are dangerous, polluters, greedy, deceptive. They're dead as barren trees and they're doomed as the fallen angels are doomed. He quotes something from, there's a, an ancient book of Enoch that the Jews have. And Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about them. See the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts that they have committed in their ungodliness and all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The, it's, it's, we need to be aware. We're told very clearly. One of the key things as you read this is to understand whether someone is a false teacher or not. Who do they talk about the most? Do they talk about Jesus? Or do they talk about themselves. It's interesting when you are chatting with someone and some terrible thing has occurred and every sentence they use as they talk to you starts with I. All they can see is themselves because the whole world is just around themselves and that's the mark of ungodliness. The mark of godliness is Jesus. He is the one that I'm related to. He's the one I'm committed to. He's the one that I'm talking about. He's the one I'm seeking to follow. He's the one I'm seeking to obey. I'm looking to his word that I can understand what he's saying to me and I can live a life that glorifies him and reflects him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Um, sadly, um, in our political systems, if you want to get voted on, you've got to get lots of friends, do you not? If you want to get in and you need to flatter, sadly, you need to flatter and, and you need to take advantage. And that's what the false teachers, that is the mark of the false teachers. Moan and groan, but their aim is to take for themselves. Jude is talking about spiritual warfare that we saw at the end of Ephesians the other week. And these are the ones who have come in amongst you and you need to recognise that their aim and purpose is to deny Jesus Christ as the only sovereign and Lord. And the aim is to draw you away from Christ and to bring you and make you religious rather than Christian, Christ's man, Christ's woman. And he said, I want to remind you, this isn't you, the devil's been going on about this from the very beginning, from the very chapter 3 of Genesis, the devil's, devil's been going on this and will continue to go on about this. But remember that it's against God that they're standing, it's ungodly actions that they're doing and therefore God sees it and God will judge. 
He will be the one who will judge. Look at all the illustrations I've given you. God judged and God will judge in the future as well. It's not new, it's clear. God understands and he is going to deal with it. But you need to recognise false teachers. So what is their trademark of character? No substance, no real substance. Everything is wrapped in themselves. It's not wrapped up in Jesus Christ. But God is going to judge. Now, that's all good, but how, what are we to now to do about this? How are we to, to go on and live in the light of this? What, what's God's aim and purpose for us as God's people now? Well, you're going to have to come next week to find out. <laughs> uh, because the, the last little bit is where Jude picks this up. What, what's the implications of this for you as God's people today? And that's what he moves us on to. Let me just pray. Now, Father, we just pray that you would enable us to grow and mature as your people here in this place. Enable us to, together to encourage and support each other that our focus remains on Jesus. We know that we are called and loved and kept Help us to focus here and to stay here together, to encourage each other. And as any of us begin to be moving away, we pray, Lord, you would en enable us to be open enough to share this with each other and to encourage each other and say, no, 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 we need to get together. Let's centre back on Jesus and let's grow together in Christ. Let's not be pulled aside. Let's fulfil God's plan and purpose for us that he has for us here in this place in Robertson. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen.